So, hey, Ben, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. So, Ben, could you give us just a super high level bio and, and just tell us a little bit about what you're interested in? Yeah. So very high level. I try to understand society and how it works. That's very big. The thing I've been most focused on for the past couple of years is industry and power and how those relate to each other. And also taking an angle of individual psychology, and which is something I've studied a bunch a few years ago and trying to bring that in as well. There, these are all pieces that I think are part of the, how do you understand the sort of zoomed out, how this big mess that all of us are caught together and how does it work? Uh, so for the past few years, I've been uh, at, working at Bismarck Analysis as a consultancy that was founded by Samo Boria. You may have uh, read his great founder theory or some of his other work. I've been uh, studying under him for quite some time. That's great. So Ben, I, I wanted to jump right into it. Why does it seem like only America can innovate? You know, we've got all these countries across the world. We've got all these developed countries as well, Western Europe. You know, you can think of like South Korea, Japan, China. Why does it seem like most of the innovation comes from America? Yeah, so it's a really interesting question because if you look at what's happened with technology and where it's come from, since the end of World War II, you see that if you distinguish between breakthrough technologies of like you're making something completely new, you're making solar panels, you're making the internet, you're making CNC machine tools, uh, like all that stuff, it only comes from the USA, which is weird. And if you look at like the incremental improvements, who's making the batteries a bit better, who's making the cheaper cameras, who's making the more efficient cars, that happens a bunch more places. So. It's specifically the breakthrough stuff that seems to only happen in America. And I th the reason for this, uh, there's a bunch of things you need in order to have this. Most places don't have any innovation, uh, even sort of on the margin, you have to be at the forefront technologically. There's a bunch of places that are at the forefront, but you also have to be willing to like really reorder the way that your economy and your industry and larger parts of your society as a whole are set up. So, you know, the, the internet comes in and lots of other businesses, you know, when this was, when it was new, the idea that your job would just be gone because of the internet, the travel agent was sort of the example in the 2000s that everyone was using. Now there's a lot more jobs like that too. Uh, and you have to be willing to tolerate lots and lots of that stuff. You know, you've got the car coming in. It's not just that like, oh, there's a car. Some guy can buy a car if he wants. You have to be like, the idea of what a road is has to completely change. You have to make it out of new materials. People have to learn that they can't go into the street or they might get hit by this thing going at 35 <laughs> miles an hour. Like all these new businesses like gas stations and motels have to come into existence. And like people have to get used to like, you know, now there's all these things shooting by, there's smog, there's sound. Like any really big industrial change has stuff like this, which is why, you know, they used to call it creative destruction. Now people call it disruption in Silicon Valley. And of the societies that we have at the industrial forefront, Germany doesn't really like that. Japan doesn't really like <laughs> that. China doesn't really like that. So the United States is the only country in the world today that's at the technological forefront and that is willing to tolerate, and not just tolerate, but is willing to glorify a lot of that type of disruption, destruction, reordering, and the people who do it, who are like really weird people. And so- and does, does that have something to do with Americans apparently being such free thinkers, which works really well when you're dreaming big ideas, but works not well at all when you've got to get the group together to do something like problem. control. Yeah, like control the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, so I think it absolutely does play into that. And it is possible to have both the free thinking and the well-structured people are doing their jobs, all of the, you it's know, not like a hard trade off. Yeah, like if you look at, you know, during the Second World War is probably the most obvious example where you have all of these, you know, crazy free thinkers do, doing all sorts of weird stuff. 
And you also have everyone sort of in their job at the right place at exactly the right moment so that you can, and like in order to do something like the D-Day landing, you need both of those. I was just reading about apparently during the invasion of Italy, like there was this harbor that they captured and completely smashed up. And then like two months after they had it working better than it had been before the invasion. Right. And like, which is tough to fathom today. Right. But that takes both the everyone doing their job in the sort of predictable, very competent way. And also the sort of American looking around at the harbor and being like, you know what? I bet we could do this better. <laughs> right. And so America has been getting worse at the sort of basic boring competence thing. Uh, it looks to me like there's been sort of a slow decline on that over the past several decades, but like we still have the free thinking. We still have the like, you know what, like I'm going to move all of humanity into space. And the way to start doing that is to open this bookstore on the internet. This is actually Jeff Bezos's origin. Right. Story. <laughs> just, just a wild thing to think about. Yeah. You right. remind and, me, you know, we've been reading the book uh, by General Groves. Uh, now it can be told. It's about the Manhattan Project. He's the guy who managed the Manhattan Project on the army side. Right. So he's like the, the pure management guy. And then op he picked open hybrid to be his, you know, tech lead. And it's like, you know, he's just talking about how he's just jamming these scientists on you will not work on your passion project. You're working on, you know, heavy water, you know, heavy water production. That's the only thing you're working on. And just like, it, it seems like we were much better at having that ability to kind of force through coordination problems than we were, than we are today. Yeah. And like, because it's really, really hard, like you have to get these <laughs> completely different cultures. You have to get the sort of weirdo scientists with their crazy hair who, you know, you've heard the stories about Feynman, you know, <laughs> in the most secure research facility in the earth, breaking into other people's top secret files for fun. So like they you have to get that. this and the army to like work together. They have a completely different culture. They're right. both reporting to the political side of things, which has a third culture. And like these people, like if you, they will talk to each other and not really understand what the other person is saying <laughs> because the idea of what's important and how you think and how you relate to people is just so foreign. You can see this today when like, you know, some Silicon Valley leader is trying to talk to, you know, the assistant secretary of whatever, or is in Congress, like they just speak different languages. It's really hard to navigate. And like the fact that Groves and these people were able to wrangle that, were able to manage it. Like it was a really big job. Like my understanding is that a lot of Groves' job was just Man, trying to bridge problems. that cultural yeah. gap. But like the, the success added, I consider it to be not as big an achievement as the actual engineering challenges, of course, but like quite a big achievement just in its own right. Definitely, especially in the time frame. It's just incredible. Right. So, uh, so moving on, you know, what is industrial policy and state capacity? These two separate things, but, and why are they important? Yeah. So I'm going to, these are two quite different concepts and I'm going to take them one at a time because the, they're, they're fairly different in that industrial policy is more like a measure of like the input almost and state capacity is more a measure of like what you're getting. Uh, so industrial policy is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. So you have a government that has some policies, some of those policies affect industry. And so that is your industrial policy. And this can be like the really obvious stuff like, oh, we're putting a tariff on steel to make it easier for us to have a steel industry that's built up domestically. Uh, sometimes that works well, sometimes it doesn't. But like very easily you can see how that's a policy about industry. And then there's a lot of other things which you know, you have the, these sort of the Congress is making these laws, it says so, it's called a law, it's very easy to tell. Uh, but there's a lot of things which I think of as de facto industrial policy. They are policies by government actors that affect industry uh, that are not quite so easy to interpret as, you know, in the 1800s you have, we're just going to spend a bunch of money and allocate a bunch of land to railroads. Obviously that's industrial policy, but for the past, since around World War I in the United States, a lot of the de facto industrial policy has been done by the military. Uh, like I was just reading earlier today about uh, General Electric after the war was going to, uh, to be making these big radio transmitters that could uh, transmit across the Atlantic Ocean and sell them to a British company. 
And so an admiral from the Navy comes over and asks them to not do that <laughs> because they'd rather that that be owned by Americans uh, because this isn't in that book, but from other things, because the British owned a bunch of the radio and telegraph infrastructure and were just spying on everything. Uh, so because of that, they don't build this thing and sell it to the British. They instead buy the British company and set up this American, <laughs> uh, the Radio Corporation of America. So uh, like the military is getting quite involved in that. It works out quite well. The RCA ends up being like this huge, very profitable manufacturer or you know, the CNC machine tools, that is how pretty much all the complex machines are made. Those were invented for Air Force contracts. And of course the internet is from a military R&D lab. Right. So a lot of times this gets overstated into like, oh, all, you know, so much technology progress comes from the military. I think this is pretty unusual and it's because of the military industrial complex in the US being surprisingly good at industrial policy. And also the military industrial complexes in uh, Germany and England up until World War II also being pretty good at it. Got but it. I think that is historically unusual. But you don't just want to look at the literal government. You also want to look at sort of the wider conception of like the things that might be the state. So like also civic infrastructure or just the cultural component is, I guess, not exactly industrial policy, but it influences it. But you asked about two things. Uh, so That's before right. I spend the whole podcast on industrial policy, which is definitely a deep enough topic to do that. Well, but uh, before before you skew, uh, stay capacity, actually, I yeah. wanted to ask you, um, maybe we could deconstruct an example. Uh, Huawei and 5G, that seems to be a big area of, you know, we've been started, we started to think about this more recently, um, where, you know, we're like, wow, these are the only makers of 5G equipment. They're from China. So there's kind of a Chinese enterprise. Maybe we need our own. And maybe there's right. only like, you know, some Swedish company that'll make it. And oh no, like how are we going to actually source these things? But it seems like there's been more thinking about that lately. Right. And the parallels between this and the General Electric and Radio Corporation of America after the First World War are like, it's very, very similar. It's <laughs> right, like the same, same thing. thing. It's like, here's the most advanced communications infrastructure in the world. Like, do we want that to be like made and operated by this other larger country that, right. you know, so yeah, America has definitely been trying to pressure people to not adopt that. Uh, the big difference is back then, like we had General Electric making uh, the giant transmitters. Today, we don't actually have anyone who can make stuff quite as good as a lot of the Huawei stuff. So we don't have an American competitor that can slot in as easily, which puts a lot of the American diplomatic pressure in a much trickier situation because we don't really have as good an alternative to offer. So should, that's should we, should we be protecting, you know, our own 5G companies? You know, what are some good policies, you know, if you're an American, American, you know, foreign po policy expert, you know, what would you be thinking about? Uh, so I would be thinking about like, why don't we already have this? Like, it's kind of scary. Does, doesn't it seem a little bit weird? Yes. Like, you know, we're so, if we're supposed to be the sort of most technologically advanced nation on earth, then like, did, is there just like, is it somehow not profitable to do here? Do we, does it take a really particular kind of guy and just none of those guys wanted to do it? Like, is there some particular technological thing that the Chinese know that we don't, that would really surprise me. I bet it's not that. So before you intervene on this, you have to understand, you know, why hasn't it already happened? Where if Got you're it. in China and you're like, how do we import the cutting edge thing that we know works in South Korea? Like the answer to that question is really obvious. You're, you know, doing right. all the ketchup growth. America's not doing the ketchup growth. So first you have to understand why we don't have this industry at the cutting edge already before you can fix that because like if it's just a matter like i bet it's not just a matter of throw a couple hundred million and like have some american build the version because like and it happens if it were that you'd expect the sort of normal market stuff to have done it so right figuring out why it hasn't already happened has just got to be the first step because there aren't any one size fits all industrial policy interventions they're all they all have to fit into the right like into the right context in ways gotcha. that can be fairly subtle. Cause like you can, if you just were like, Oh yeah, we're going to do a tariff to protect it. 
and the fundamentals aren't there, then maybe you just keep an inefficient thing inefficient so that they can keep making lots of money without getting good. That's happened in like Brazil and some other places. Right. Like you can't get any video games in Brazil at all. You know, it costs like you have to. Yeah, it's actually a real thing. Like they talk about how it's like impossible to get real video games and, you know, you have to like smuggle them in. It's pretty interesting because they try to actually protect the video game industry. So there could be bad consequences. It also reminds me. uh, So my sister works at the only vaccine filling station uh, plant left in the United States. It's in eastern North Carolina, about 60 miles from here. And I was just struck when the pandemic came on because it's like, wow, there's only one of these plants left. All the rest of them are, are in China. And, you know, if that was gone, yeah, right, you know, it, things like that are really important for, I think, for policymakers to think right. about. And so that one is like, if we have one operating, then like, that is relatively easier to then scale it up Just and like that. take yeah. the thing you already have one of and copy those. So I wouldn't be shocked if we start doing that for that one in particular, because it's so obvious why we need <laughs> that now. <laughs> We'd hope so, right? We hope would so. Hope. Um, so state capacity. Yeah. I cut you off. State capacity is in some ways a much weirder beast because like what people mean by it is sort of like, what is it overall that the state can do? And like, you can talk about it in general, like sometimes the state has more capacity, sometimes the state has less capacity. Uh, like, you know, the middle of the 20th century, America is generally considered to have had very high state capacity. They could just be like, we're going to build a, you know, countrywide system of highways. And then they build one of those. Uh, they can be like, we're going to go to the moon in a decade. And it happens. And then like, right. And then today we're like, okay, we're going to build a high speed rail network. Okay. Maybe we're not going to build a network. Maybe we're just going to build these few lines. Okay. Most of those lines got vetoed, but here's the one we're allocating $10 billion to build this high speed rail line in California. Okay. We spent the money and we don't have a high speed rail line. <laughs> so like, something changed and not in a sort of like, oh, maybe it's like, this one's a democracy, this one's authoritarian, because both of them are democracies. On paper, they have exactly the same constitution. Right. It's sort of, if you look at the institutions and the people, the sort of competence that they have, what are they, what outcomes are they able to produce? And if you zoom out and sort of blur your eyes, you will see that some states are in general more competent and have the capacity to do more things. When you get to the specifics, it's not so clear cut because the overall, like all of the capacities that a state could have, you know, sometimes you'll have like Israel recently demonstrated that they are extremely good at distributing a vaccine. So that's the capacity that they have that it seems no one else in the world is as good at. But when it comes to manufacturing vaccines, they don't have that capacity in the way that, you know, Europe and the United States do. So it's not like just a binary thing. But nevertheless, a lot of people argue, and I think this is mostly right, that stump states are generally more competent across the board. Gotcha. So- and that's really important to tons and tons and tons of things, like if you happen to be surprised by a pandemic. Absolutely. So what do you think has happened? Like what's caused this decline in the U.S. of, of state capacity? Is it uh, just like some kind of entropy that all organizations have where, uh, or maybe like Pornell's iron law where, you know, in any bureaucracy, the people devoted to the benefit of the bureaucracy end up getting in control over time and the people who actually do things get displaced. That's a big part of it. Uh, And uh, so like you definitely have the sort of shifting of any institution over time will tend to, by default drift in the direction of serving its own interests and the interest of the people there rather than whatever it was originally engineered to do. Uh, That's definitely a factor. Uh, But I don't think that explains, like if you were to like make a rough graph of United States state capacity from like 1900 till today, it doesn't just decline in the way that it would if that were the only thing going on. Like you see it like sort of Throughout, throughout much of the early 20th century, it's, I think, going up, uh, probably peaks 40s, 50s, uh, and, then, and then starts like a pretty slow but quite long slide down is my very oversimplified picture of it. So I think a lot of it is also the traditions of knowledge, which is to say the things that the people know how to do that are being taught and widely understood by a big group of people 
So these get created and lost all the time. And so you have a bunch of people who know really well how to interact with each other and how to think about how organizing society works. And then that's really hard to teach. And after that's you know, discovered and disseminated, the, they don't do quite as good a job teaching the people who come after them. And those people don't do quite as good a job teaching the people who come after them. And like, there's some relatively easy things to track. Like if you read the stuff that the people are writing, how much are they thinking about who's going to replace them? Where this is something in the middle of the century, like people just have their eye on. And Interesting. like nowadays I see people very often start worrying about this when they're like maybe in their sixties. Gotcha. Which is like pretty late. It's too late. Uh, and uh, so this is a really obvious like, oh, this is a thing that you need to be tracking, which seems to have sort of been tracked less. And the, there's a sort of phenomenon that happens a lot, which lead, makes it harder for this stuff to get shared, uh, which we call people not getting the joke, where mm. a lot of the time, the way you organize something is like not the type of thing you want to tell everyone about. So you have this, like, you'll have some other story that's the story that you tell externally. Uh, so you have, you know, in the 60s, 70s, got this big story that, that the American economists have about like, yeah, free markets, we're going to like all the, throughout the whole world, we're going to do free markets, free trade. Uh, this is sort of the line quite shortly after World War II. Meanwhile, there's tons of state support, tons of aid being given, to, you know, through the Marshall Plan to Western Europe. Right. Uh, and like a lot of the places that are being rebuilt and industrializing, you know, Japan, South Korea, are doing it in very non-free trade ways. Uh, so the thing that's being said and the thing that's actually being done are pretty different. But then the people who, the next generation of people come in and they're like, yeah, free trade, that's how you do it. And they like believe that to a much greater extent. Got it. And so then they start doing more of like the external thing that they were told rather than the actual thing that was happening before. And this happens a bunch of places, probably some that have, that like, I haven't detected, probably there's a bunch where I just do still believe the external story. I've never looked close enough. So this is one big way that a lot of the knowledge gets lost. That's so, really interesting. So people like misconstrue like the, what's actually going on with like the story people tell themselves and then right. like no, no one tells them they're in on the joke and, and you get this, this kind of loss of knowledge. It reminds me, have you ever read The Disappearance of Useful Arts? No. It's great. It's by W.H.R. Rivers. He was an anthropologist. I'll send you, we did an episode on it, but he it's describes great. how the... Um, it, he gives a couple of different cases, but how some civilizations lose technology. And he mm -hmm. talks about how the Inuit and in green Greenland, they, you know, they had a tribe, all the elders died in a plague and they didn't have seafaring kayaks for like a hundred years till they encountered someone else that had seafaring kayaks. They just completely forgot how to do it. And right. so like, if you lose your elders and they don't transfer that knowledge, you can be in a real pickle. Right. And like this happens with physical technology occasionally, like, the Roman architecture that got lost after the, the empire fell wasn't really equaled until like, you know, s many centuries later, like what, maybe 1100 or so. Right. And like, but that's relatively rare because you can still just go and look at the kayak. You can go and look at the building. Right. Like it still happens occasionally, but with like social stuff about human organization where you can't just like go and look at the thing as easily, especially the thing as it existed 15 years ago. Like, it seems it's like that gets difficult. lost a lot more frequently. That's really interesting. And people have a lot of incentives not to tell you exactly what's going on, you know, if they're right. writing like, about it or talking to the press. Yeah, if some other guy understands how to build the kayak, that's much less of a threat to you. <laughs> right. And if he understands how to organize a political pressure group, which can, you know, defeat the exactly. candidates. Definitely, it's a lot different. Right. Dad, did you have a question? Uh, I was, I was, I was, it was sort of what you and Ben were just talking about. It's like, I wonder how much of this is sort of this loss of skill, loss of talent is, is just due to necessity. You have to develop it out of need. And then when you have it, times get good. Everybody kind of relaxes. They just get relaxed because they've got it. And life is good. Yeah, I think this is a part of it. But so I think the, the big question here is if this is how things get lost, then how do things get built and why does it like, 
why does it happen in some periods and not others? Where definitely one of the most popular theories of this is like when things are really hard, that's when the people, you know, that's when the rubber hits the road and the people really make it work. But I don't think that really holds up because like if you look at the United States in the period that we've been talking about, like it was actually like really safe. Like there were these world wars, which we could have just not been in. There was like on the other right. side of these giant oceans. Like we were not under any sort of existential threat. The Italians are being like occupied. They don't do this. Right. Uh, so like, I don't think the necessity at the sort of civilization scale is what does it. I think it depends a lot more on like particular weird individual people sort of getting the necessity thing in themselves and then also being in the right position to actually figure out these really, really hard things and then like transmit that to a bunch of people, which doesn't always track the sort of like society scale necessity, society scale, how hard are things in the way that you would expect. So it seems from the sort of macro historical view a lot less predictable to me, I think. Interesting. Like you just don't really know when you're going to get, you know, a Napoleon who then like figures out how to have a general staff and sort of like this is the military command structure that then gets adopted by pretty much everyone for like, a lot of that DNA is still in how we organize our militaries today, actually. Right. So maybe it's a little bit more random than people realize. Yeah, it's not like, just like some hard external pressure that always causes people to get their act together. Yeah, that's that's my view, but this is argued about a lot. Right, <laughs> I, be I believe so. <laughs> that's great. Um, I wanted to ask you about machine tooling. I know you've yes. uh, talked about it a lot. You're taking me back to high school and shop class, and you know I, I know a lot of guys that work with CNC and stuff like that. So I, I know you've, you've written a case study. I'd also like to talk you to talk a little bit about case studies and why you think they're important. Oh, um, they are the best. Yeah, that's great. Oh, do you want to go ahead and just like uh, you know pitch case studies? I yeah, think this so, is really important. Yeah. So when you're doing social science, when you're doing any science, your theory is limited by the data that you have. Uh, you like you can come up with all sorts of clever ideas, but like of course you have to be empirical about it to tell the really clever things where it's a tragedy that that's just not how it works from the stuff that actually holds up. And so, when you're dealing with like society, then the case study is sort of the rawest data point that you can have. It's like when you look closely at a thing and you're seeing this is how it works. Oh, this is why, this is what this person did. This is what that person did. Uh, here's, how, here's how it all moved. Like this, when you have a theory about how things go, like I can't tell you how many times I've got, here's my explanation. Here's why everything happens. I go deep into the study and it's just like, okay, here's three things that just flatly contradict my story of right. how it works in a way that if you, you know, are just doing these like, you know, shallow summaries or your these like statistical summaries you just don't get deep in enough to see that or maybe you kind of see it but you can interpret it in a way that it doesn't clash but this was sort of like really looking at the thing close up one it can directly falsify your theories and a lot of how i choose them is the ones that can falsify however i'm thinking about it but two once you've done a bunch of these once you've just interacted with a bunch of you know the data points whether this be you you know, a bunch of historical things or contemporary, you generally want to mix. Uh, if you get them from very different periods, then you'll, you can sort of get a sense of the overall outline. Uh, someone's like, oh, here's how I think it all works. And you're like, okay, so this fits, you know, the, these two case studies, but the third one I've done, it actually doesn't explain. So maybe that's happening sometimes, but it can't be what's happening all the time. Because you can like, check the things against the various explanations that you hear and just see if they line up. Got it. And then it is also very important to get them from a wide range of, you know, times, different types of societies, because if all of your case studies are from, you know, 1970 until today, maybe there's a thing that was true from 1970 until right. today that wasn't true in 1780. And so this lets you tell the general explanations of things from the specific explanations of things. That's great. I think it's a very underrated tool in social science case studies. Yes, it's used a lot. And I also think it's very underrated. It's still underrated. It's that That's important. <laughs> um, 
So you wrote one on machine tooling. Can you talk to yes. a little, us a little bit about machine tooling? Yeah. So it's which for anyone who doesn't really know what it is, machine tooling is a it's any sort of tool that moves along predetermined paths in order to like carve out material. Uh, they've come a very long way. Uh, the, I would highly recommend looking at a YouTube video of a modern uh, computer controlled machine tool. Uh, the, the earlier ones were purely mechanical. They would like move along a set track or something like that. Uh, but, but they're used for making any sort of complex shape. And there's sort of a phrase I heard a lot is the tools that make the tools. So if you have some, if there's something that's going to be made by pouring into a mold, you will often use a machine tool to carve out that mold. Or if there's like some big robot, then a lot of the robot pieces will be made out on the machine tool and then like attached together. So all sorts of the basic industrial components get made with these things. Uh, and we were looking a lot at where they're made and why those places were the ones that made them uh, historically. So we ended up going back to like, mostly, mostly we ended up going back to around World War II and then in a less fidelity going back like another 50, 60 or years or so to when a lot of the real industrials, uh, the, the really industrial powerful and in, in, industrially good machine tools go back further than that. But uh, there's a bunch of interesting things that came out of that. And a lot of the point of that case study was to just get a better sense of supply chains and industry generally uh, by looking at a very particular case uh, like we were just talking about. And so with machine tools, you find it used to be that the United States was just absolutely crushing, uh, crushingly dominant position. Uh, nowadays, the US is, I think, I wanna say number six in the world at machine tool production as measured by like dollar value. Uh, the most advanced places today are Japan and Germany, uh, which interestingly got built up these big industries uh, with the American invented technology shortly after World War II with a lot of American support when we were trying to have all these places that we had just conquered and occupied, you know, reindustrialize, grow, grow fast enough that no one would want to turn communist and also have be able to make tanks if we needed them to help us fight <laughs> the communists. Right. Uh, so that worked really well. They, they you know, super industrially important. Uh, Taiwan's also a really big deal. China is making a huge volume of machine tools that tend to be less advanced, but that is changing. And my intuition is that when maybe like 10, 15 years, I wouldn't be shocked if they are on par with Germany and Japan in terms of the sophistication of what they're making. Got uh, it. And so like a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of industrially important places are net importers of these machine tools. Cause if you just want to have lots of industry, you need to have these tools. Uh, and they're like just the modern ones are extremely complex to make. Uh, one of the really interesting things was the Soviet machine tool industry, which during the Cold War was like pretty good. Oh, wow. uh, it was generally less efficient than the American machine tool industry, and the machines they would make were not as advanced, but they had it. It was economically productive. Uh, you know, they were using this to build all of their rockets and Sputnik and all that stuff. So like they had a complete machine tool industry because of the Iron Curtain, because there was not really much trade allowed with the West. Right. Uh, and then once the Soviet Union fell and all of that was liberalized, the, the whole machine tool industry just like evaporated in a few years because now that you could import the American things or the German things like you can just get a better tool for cheaper. And so the Soviet industry goes away. So I think it's really fascinating that with that sort of artificial barrier, you know, this thing could be economically viable well it had the sort of very extreme geopolitically dictated protectionist regime. Right. Uh, and nowadays it just can't. And the you know, Russians, the Russian military is like fairly concerned about the fact that all of their machine <laughs> tools are imported and like, They've made efforts to try to, you know, 
nurture a Russian machine tool industry, which just haven't worked because full iron curtain levels of, you know, stopping trade are just not on the table. Right. Th this is really interesting to me. Uh, and, and that, and, and that illustrated, you know, illustrating the iron curtain and the Soviets capability to uh, build, you know, quality machine tools and their inability to do it now. Do you think this model of having management and innovation in the U S and then just outsourcing all our ability to create, you know, things like machine tooling, um, is that a sustainable model or not is that at all. No. not? All. Okay, not good. <laughs> good to hear that. Uh, so there's several reasons for that. One of which is like, how are you going to innovate if you're not in touch with the actual process? Great like, if, if, the, if South Korea is making more machine tools, South Korea is making more machine tools in an absolute sense, like, than the United States, never mind per capita. And like, who is going to have a better idea on how to innovate? Like, the guy <laughs> who actually is there making the tool or the guy who's you know, in an right, office theoretically. reports about the tools. So right. like, there's like one world-class machine tool company in America. It's uh, based outside of LA. And like, whereas in Japan, there's like a city that just has a giant dense cluster of machine tool manufacturers. It's sort of like the same way that LA is just where all the creative types are bouncing their ideas off of each other and being like, what if we, you know, take this, your idea for a movie and change it in this way, wouldn't that be cool? Like, <laughs> the way, like the way that people talk about Silicon Valley as a, as a hub, you know, right. like you've got all these people trying to outdo each other, coming up with new ideas for what to do on the internet. Like you, you can't, you don't have that if you have a low density of doing the actual activity. Uh, this is like a big part of why the Romans were so technologically stagnant in spite of having an empire that was very impressive in many other ways, because the people who were like controlling the, the agriculture were these absentee landlords who the way they would get rich would not be by managing the farm better. The way they would get rich would be by getting appointed governor of, you know, transalpine Gaul or whatever, <laughs> and just extorting a ton of money. And so like they were really good at the military innovation, but when it came to the production, the people who would benefit just were too far away from it. Gotcha. And so if you want to be doing the innovation, it's just so, so much easier if you have like the people who are making the decisions are actually in contact with it and succeed or fail based on how well it works. And it's very hard to do that if you're outsourcing everything. Right. Well, it seems like something policymakers really need to think about because in a potential conflict, it seems to be very important. And that actually goes along with my, my next question, unless you have any other thoughts on machine tools that you think would be important for people to hear. Uh, in the interest of not talking about them for the rest <laughs> of our time, I will. Let's move on. <laughs> great, great. So uh, you wrote a post on the great illusion. I, I've read the Wikipedia page. I haven't read the book, but, um, uh, and I read this a couple years ago and I found it was, uh, it seemed quite pertinent to read in light of the U S China kind of cold conflict, whatever you could call it right now. And perhaps a coming hot war, um, which I think is a, I, I find this a much higher possibility than I think most people do. Um, yeah, that could just I be think, my bias, but yeah, I, I don't think it's super likely, but I think people should worry about it more than they often do. Yeah. Right. Um, so the great illusion, you know, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the book, um, you know, when it was written, why it's important and uh, any conclusions we could draw from that? Yeah. So the great illusion was written by this British guy shortly before world war one, where he's trying to stop the war from happening. He's trying to argue that it is pointless and doesn't need to happen. And the thing that's going on is there's tons of people uh, in Britain and Germany who are talking about how they need to go to war because of economics, how <laughs> they need to like control parts of the world and how like, you know, British shipping is threatened by the German Navy. The German shipping is threatened by the British Navy. Uh, you've got to knock them down if you want to keep having trade and keep making money. Uh, you need all the colonies. You need to like, be able to project your military power into the different markets. So Norman Angle writes this book where he's like, all of you are really dumb. That's not how it works. Uh, 
So his argument is basically that you make money from trade and you don't make money from conquest. That like, you know, he says you can make money if it's medieval times and you like conquer the castle and take out the big chest of silver. But like, that's not what money is anymore. Now right. it's like stocks. Now it's like this intangible stuff in these corporations, which like you can't really conquer. And if you do, like you would lose more than you gain. Right. And so this is just a really terrible reason to go to war. <laughs> and if you do go to war, even the winners are going to lose money and are going to like, not just money, but like real wealth, like goods and services are going to be poorer. And he was basically right about World War I. Like the people who won World War I didn't really get much wealth out of it. Like when the Germans are conquering Belgium, they're not able to turn Belgium into like an industrial powerhouse in order to feed the German war machine. Like, the, like most of the Belgians are just like, well, okay, I'm just leaving my job at the steel factory because I don't want to make fuel for the Germans. And the right. Germans are just sort of looking at him being like, darn. Oh man. I wish they were working at that steel factory. Right. So for World War I, it's basically right. Then World War II happens. And then the, you know, the Germans overrun Poland and you know, if someone's like, I don't want to work at that factory, then they just shoot him in the head. Right. And like, so it's completely different dynamics. And uh, you've got like, they, they're able to extract tons of like natural resources. They're able to, you know, from Vichy France, they just extort huge amounts of money. They get many, like many, many laborers, especially slave laborers from Poland, but also a fair amount uh, of, of labor from France that they just import into Germany to run German factories. A lot of how they do it is raw materials and intermediate parts are made outside of Germany proper, shipped back and then assembled into airplanes or whatever. So the thing that uh, Norman Engel is right about when he's writing this book, The Great Illusion, before either of these world wars have happened, he can't see all that stuff is that if you're sort of operating on this abstracted level of like finance and money and gold, then like he's basically correct about the way the trade networks work about how like you don't actually need to, you know, if you want German machine tools, you don't have to conquer Berlin. It's right. way cheaper to just like buy some machine tools you're from buying. Germany than to try to invade them. Uh, and everyone will be richer that way. Uh, and then but like when you get to the sort of naked expropriation, what was, I don't think it was obvious. It had never really been done at scale with an industrial society, but like we have now seen that it is possible to do, to like make it, to make those, uh, basically if you're willing to be violent enough in a way that the Germans were not willing to do in World War I under the Kaiser, but like the Nazis absolutely were willing to do at that point, it is possible to just directly seize. And like, you have the German stock market going up and like tons of actual just goods being produced. So I've been reading this book, uh, Does Conquest Pay by Peter Lieberman, who's uh, doing a bunch of case studies. Someone recommended this to me. I saw it's a book that's a collection of case studies. So I'm like, I'm sold. Uh, and that's awesome. So he's looking back at a bunch of uh, things from the 20th century of uh, conquering nations either succeeding or failing at you know, turning the conquered areas to productive industrial production. And sort of like, here's what you have to, like if you do X, Y, Z, it can work. X, Y, and Z tend to be like very unpleasant. Like there are things that I would want to not happen in the world, but like right. if they are done, then like the thing can work okay, which is, in some ways a disconcerting conclusion, uh, but is important to think about. But like when it comes to, you know, you were talking about China, the big thing that I hear people talking about uh, with, as like the potential reason for a war with China is Taiwan. And it's an interesting case there because like if Taiwan is, you know, it's small in absolute terms, but it's quite heavily industrialized. Uh, and so the Chinese have been doing a pretty good job. They've been of getting the advanced practices and industrial technology 
from Taiwan of duplicating those in China itself. Uh, the commercial links between China and Taiwan are very strong, as you would expect from giant industrial nations right. or like, or like being so close to each other on the like gravity model of trade. Like, yeah, that should be a big deal. And indeed it is. Right. Uh, so there's a sense in which they don't necessarily like the, as it stands right now, they have access to the benefits of the Taiwanese industrial output in the way that Norman Engel would say, this is all you need. And as long as there isn't the type of war that would make the Taiwanese act like the Belgians and be like, okay, we're going to like cut those links unilaterally. Right. Like that will remain true. And then the question is, as the Chinese are looking out and being like, but can we count on that remaining true? Like, right. Sort of the thing we've learned that it is possible if you're willing to, you know, shoot people in the back of the head in the way that Hitler or Stalin would like, right. That is a thing which they have at least the ability to, uh, uh, at least the theoretical ability to do if they were to, uh, to, you know, gain control of the Island. That makes a lot of sense. Side note unrelated, but I think Taiwanese, uh, defensive capability is severely underrated. It seems like there was like one week in like the early 2000s where the defense establishment's whole stance on like how long they could hold out just completely flipped. It's like, oh, it's a week. You know, it's like, oh, no, they'd be, they'd be fine for months without American aid. Now it's like, it's a week. <laughs> I don't know. Huh. And it, I, I think it's much easier to deny, you know, access to territory, especially an island, than it is like to invade one. But yeah, what do I, know? I mean, this stuff is so hard to predict because no one really knows what happens if two serious major powers fight a war with access to today's technology. It's just never right. been done. So like, I don't think anyone like these guesses may be the best that anyone can do, but like, I don't think anyone should take any of them too, too strongly. Cause there's just right. in any war, there's so many unknowns. And if there were a war today, it would be very different from any war that's been fought in the past. Definitely. It's not something we've done before. Um, hopefully we won't find out anytime yeah, soon it would be preferable <laughs> <laughs> I would very happily be ignorant for the rest of my life fine with that uh, so uh, next little se section um, I stole this blatantly from Tyler Cowan it's overrated and underrated and why yeah. um, so I'm going to go ahead and throw one out there so the stirrup overrated or underrated yeah so the stirrup I think overrated there's a lot of people who talk about the stirrup as like a complete game changer uh, that transforms warfare and makes it so that cavalry goes from being not very useful to being sort of the mainstay of these medieval armies. Uh, I don't buy this. Uh, th there's a couple of reasons for this, but the big one is that the historians don't really agree on when the stirrup actually entered Europe. Oh, interesting. And like, if you look at the different estimates, they're like hundreds of years apart. And, Wide gap. Right. And like there's particular like the particular battles where they can't really agree on like whether the cavalry was the reason that it won or if the cavalry had stirrups at like Adrianopoly is like I've just seen very smart people argue both sides of this. And like for a major transformative military innovation, that's just not what you see. If you look back at ancient uh, war and you're like, did they have castles in the like sense of the castle as this sort of medieval super weapon that can't be breached except by this giant siege? Like if you're looking back and you have like this very fragmentary evidence and like, you know, bad records by biased people, you will know if they had a castle, it would just change everything. Right. And so if you're looking back at this, like, you know, like if it, to have a gap of hundreds of years of if we don't know they have a stirrup, like it can't be that big a deal. So definitely, definitely not trivial. Definitely if you have an army of horsemen using lances, you definitely prefer a stirrup. But like, I don't right. think it can be that transformative as is sometimes argued. And we would know if it was such a big deal. Um, you may be biased about this next one, but that's okay. I think it's a great concept for people to hear about. Great yeah. founder theory. Yeah. So great founder theory uh, as... Uh, many of you will know is the th sort of big theory of social change behind a lot of the stuff upstream of the state capacity things we were talking about earlier uh, by Samo Boria, who's my mentor and my boss. Uh, so I think it's actually pretty well rated. Uh, I think it's not super widely known, 
among the people who know of it, they tend to have like quite a high opinion of it, which I think is well warranted. I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, it's the main lens I use for most of my analysis. And I would say I've actually been like pretty happy with the extent to which other people seem able to recognize it and pick it up. So I wish it were better known, but I'm pretty happy with the rating of the people who don't do know about it, I think is pretty good. Right. So I've got this theory that if you uh, believe in the efficient market hypothesis, um, all your answers to the overrated, underrated should generally be correctly rated. So I think that's, <laughs> that's well, well put. I, but, I uh, mostly don't believe in the efficient market well, hypothesis. Well, that's great. That's so. great. That's good. <laughs> um, so I, can you tell us just what great founder theory is? I, I thought I should we should mention that as well. Yeah. Folks so, know. I know it's complicated, so I don't want to. So I'm not going to do it justice. If you want to... Uh, get the full version, you should go into uh, Samo Buria's manuscript, just search Great Founder Theory. I'm sure that'll pull it up. Uh, but to give the Cliff Notes version, it's that the, the, the particular ways that society is organized have to be developed. They have to, there has to be a person who understands how people work and how societies work and engineers a way of interaction. And then the most effective of those get super widely copied. Gotcha. And that matters a lot. And so there are particular founders who create institutions that are unlike the institutions that have existed before. Maybe it's like a small change. Maybe it's a big change. Maybe it's many big changes. And then the ones that work really well then get widely imitated and determine huge swaths of how societies are organized and how well they work. Got it. Really well put. Um, the possibility of a nuclear exchange more likely than people think less likely than people think about our people generally on average. So it's about as likely as people think when they think about it at all. And people hate to think about this. <laughs> they just don't think like, about it. I will say like, Oh yeah, like that's a possibility. And people will like agree with me, but like <laughs> that is as far as it will ever no, go. We're not thinking about yeah. it. Okay. Next. Yeah. So <laughs> right. like I've never had anyone argue like, Oh no, it couldn't happen. Or like, <laughs> Maybe not never, never, but like, it's very rare. But like, the thing that's odd is that people never think about it and they never make, they never incorporate the, the idea of it into their thoughts about the world. Like I've never, never once in my life had a person be like, I was thinking of moving to that city, but like, I decided to go somewhere smaller because of like, I've never done that. But like, you know, if you even look at, you know, the headlines during the Cuban Missile Crisis. You'll have the New York Times with a big giant banner of like United States and Russia on the brink of nuclear war. And like, if that happens, I'm going to be like, well, I'm going to drive to the countryside. I'm going to fly to Australia. <laughs> not I'm hanging out here. Like, be in like Botswana or Chile or whatever. <laughs> right. But like, nobody did that, which is weird. That's a really good point. And I th that's with like this giant blast all the time, hide under your desk, <laughs> nuclear war could happen. You know, we're chaining ourselves to the White House fence. Like <laughs> there's so much more noise about it. And still people are like, huh, oh, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, a real preference. That's interesting. Well yeah, played. I think people should think about it more. The reason people don't is that it's terrifying. Right. And like people should have a plan of like, if I see a giant headline that says U.S. and Russia on the brink of nuclear war, maybe I will drive to the countryside. Yeah. Uh, maybe have so, a, yeah. You might want to yeah, get out. It's a book called Nuclear War Survival Skills, which is what it sounds like. I've read most of it. And I think you should at least have a copy in case it turns out that you need it. <laughs> you should be prepared. Likely enough to be prepared. Um, yes, exactly. It's, it's likely, it's, you know, like if you're, you know, maybe there will be an earthquake. Maybe there will be a blizzard. Maybe there will be, you know, global pandemic you, know. you should know what you're going to do if any of these things happen right have a plan um exactly. was the great depression was it worse than people think you know not as bad as people think about as uh, bad as people think so the, the thing about the great depression is it's not just a depression it's also like a big transition in the financial organization of the world uh interesting so you see like the way that currencies are relating to each other before the depression is this like very managed exchange rates and everything relating to gold in a particular way that's held in place by states. And that goes back a long time. 
And w- once World War I starts, like the way governments are spending money on the war, you can't really maintain that system. You can't really maintain those exchange rates with gold. You can't really maintain those exchange rates with the other currencies. And so there's like 10 years of people trying to prop it up and like, it's not really working that well. Like the same crises keep happening. Right. And then the whole thing sort of comes crashing down in 1929. And so you have people going off the gold standard. You have the financial capital of the world move from London to New York. Uh, and like the way that the international finance is organized changes completely. Also, the same thing goes along with this giant destruction of You know, like as you destroy the way that finance is organized, you destroy tons of businesses, tons of people are out of work, way less stuff gets produced, people have less stuff because less stuff got produced. So like, it's huge, yeah, like definitely causes tremendous, tremendous like disruption and suffering. Uh, I do think that it's sort of overweighted in the popular imagination because giant crashes like that had been happening all throughout the 1800s. And this was sort of like, it looks to me like it was one more of those rather than some horrible, like unique th- event. This so is I the big ones. Overrated economically, underrated politically. Gotcha. Elite overproduction. Is that term overrated or underrated? Uh, I would say overrated, but I'm a little bit hesitant because it's not something that I have fully delved into, but like, gotcha. My sense of it is that the idea of the elite overproduction being that so much of the strife that we're seeing is a result of there being too many of these sort of, I guess not elites, but aspiring elites jockeying for a fairly small number of like, uh, of positions. And that, and then this causes tons of infighting, which leads to a lot of the political chaos that we've been seeing and that this is a sort of cyclical thing. Uh, my biggest, I, I think, so like you definitely have a bunch of people jockeying for positions. Right. Uh, the thing which I, th- uh, my sort of disagreement with my sort of weak by osmosis understanding of the elite overproduction thing is I think that the core problem is not the number of elites, it's is our society expanding into valuable areas. Gotcha. Where uh, one of the pieces from great founder theory is the idea of expanding versus declining empires or like where empire here just means any big organization of people. So if you have a society that is expanding where this can mean economically in the, you know, if you look at the fifties where, you know, not just the U S but like all these other places, being built out, standards of living are rising, wealth is increasing, it's expanding. Lots of new positions are opening up. So the fact that you're producing a whole bunch of aspiring elites is like, great, we need those. Right. And if you have a declining uh, organization, a declining empire, then like things are shrinking, the resource pool is dropping. And, you know, whether you're producing tons and tons of aspiring elites or really maintaining the same number, like the amount of actual stuff is going down. And so the US looks to me like, you know, we're sort of on the brink of the deindustrialization. Manufacturing recently became a smaller chunk of our economy than like NGOs and nonprofits. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah, it's not a great time. <laughs> oh, God. You know, South Korea is ahead of us in machine tool production, despite being a sixth of our population. Oh, my God. So, like, it looks to me like the real, so like, economically, ideologically, like on all the big axes, the US is like, if you're going to oversimplify the expanding declining thing to a binary, we're declining. And so that's going to be a cause of infighting, which is why I haven't like, I don't know that you need to bring in all of this extra cyclical stuff about the number of elites, but there could be parts of it I've missing. I've only got the sort of like, heard people describe it and read about it on stuff. Yeah, I, I think you're 
Absolutely right. I've talked about this a lot with a bunch of different people. And I've always said, you know, I think the problem is we just don't ha- know what to do with people. You know, this right. the number is not so much like, oh, we're creating too many people a set. We don't on the back end, there's not spots to put them in. Right. And that's like, a real you know, if it's 1849, then it's like, oh, we've got too many aspiring elites. Go West, young man. And then like, <laughs> go that way. they all like go to, you know, they start, you know, building homestead farms in Washington and like painting for gold in California and like, that works out. It doesn't work out exactly. so great for the Mexicans and the Native Americans, of course. Right. But like for the Americans who are expanding West, like, you know, that, that ends up being pretty okay. The, it's easy to see the literal frontier. Right. Or like, you know, when the Greek city states would have too many people, they'd be like, okay, a bunch of the young guys are going to get on a boat and go somewhere else. <laughs> right. <laughs> get out of here. They'll find and then they're like, and then that's how they got all the colonies and ended up, you know, uh, all, all of the Greek city states and like, you know, Sicily and Italy and stuff. Right. Um, mercantilism. This is the last one. Overrated or underrated? Uh, so I think it is underrated in that it is usually understood as like an economic system by dumb people. When I think it was actually a tax <laughs> system by smart people. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> where a sort of pop history view is this is like people trying to do industrial policy badly. Right. But by like the king being like, okay, you're the one guy who's allowed to make, you know, this type of cloth. You're the one guy who's allowed, you know, you three guys are allowed to make glass. No one else can. But like, it doesn't really make any sense at all. Like I just have never heard any even potential economic justification for why being like you are not like only this one company is allowed to send ships to trade with India. Like I've never heard anyone attempt that. Right. I don't think they were trying to do that. I think they were trying to get money from the people who they were giving those privileges to. And if you look at like people like Jean Baptiste Colbert in France, they were very good at getting the money out of it. And this was, you know, in the days when you couldn't just be like, okay, everyone has to fill out your 1099. <laughs> and then like, we will know if you don't give us the right amount of money. Like you just couldn't do that. If you had your guys go around and try to do that, they would be lynched. Right. So instead you like, okay, the guild will end up administering a bunch of the tax collection and in return, they get this from us. And and they have kind of sight on, okay, Ben, you've made this much wealth. I, I know roughly what you've made and I can come in and, and take that. Yeah, it's like, okay, like there's these tariffs that are on the wine and the winemakers will enforce that. And they're like getting enough from us that this whole arrangement, both sides are overall benefiting. Sex for the wine, for the people who want to drink wine, but oh well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, well, Ben, thanks for coming on. Right, are there Will, any- can I interrupt and ask one more question? You sure can. Okay, Ben, you may have tipped this, but I'm going to ask you the big question anyway. Go for it. Are you an optimist a pes- or a pessimist, and are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Uh, so I am an optimist. Uh, so, you know, I've said a bunch of things about decline, especially decline of the United States, so this might be a bit surprising. Uh, but if you take a zoomed-out view... Like the United States has gone through several ups and downs, like the state capacity or like whatever you want to call it has got, there's been like three big spikes. And so we're currently in a relative decline, but I think we've got a very good shot at doing another revival. Like, uh, like when the, uh, the country was reorganized under Lincoln, when it was uh, reorganized with the new deal, like Reconstruction and New Deal are not just rhetorical terms. They're talking about (laughs) really major reorganizations of how the country operated. And I think we can do another one of those. I don't think we get it for free. Uh, But I think we've, but like, I would be, I would, I would be more surprised if it didn't happen than if it did. Uh, So I'm quite optimistic about that. And if you take the American ideals and you build a new system around them that takes into account the world of today and the technology of today and the social structures of today, like, I really want to see where that goes. That would be how, amazing. How do you feel about globally? Uh, globally, I also feel quite optimistic. Uh, like the one big worry that I have on the global scale is the increasing technology allows increasing destruction. 
uh, which is quite a big worry, but increasing technology also allows all of this other good stuff. Uh, and it, it also, you know, the number, the, the sheer number of people is going up, the number of people who, you know, are literate and like don't have, you know, don't have to worry about cholera and, you know, places like South Korea and China that a hundred years ago were these like hard scrabbling backwaters now at the technological forefront, pushing humanity as a whole forward. Like globally, I feel like very good. And especially if we are able to avoid getting into any wars as dumb as the first world war, like things are going to be like 50 years from now, like a lot better than today. Great. That's good. And I also, I think Ben, you talking about decline is very important because the first step to, you know, resolving this issues is even identifying that they're happening. Yes. If you can't talk and, about it, then you're really in trouble. Yeah. And like, that's, and that's why I study this stuff is because like, it can be reversed. It has been reversed, but it doesn't look like it happens automatically. And I don't think I can fix this without understanding what the hell I'm doing. Right. And, and that's actually one of my favorite parts about great founder theory is, is, you know, putting that emphasis on the fact that, you know, people have to do these things. You know, right. it, it does not autom It's not just like in the ether or something like that. Yeah. It's all people. Yeah. At the end of the day, important to remember. Well, Ben, thank you. Are there any parting shots? Where can people find you? Um, where yeah. should we send them? So my website is benlandautaylor.com, has all of my essays. I need to update it with the my most recent article I published at Palladium. Uh, I'm also on Twitter as Ben Landau Taylor. And uh, any of those, you can find my work. It'll be updated as new stuff is out. And, you, every, and yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk with interesting people. Great. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much. It was really good to be on.